If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. I post a new Tom Brady video every day. And in 2001, one of my very first assignments at ESPN Magazine, the editor sent me up to Foxborough to write about the quarterback who was filling in admirably for Drew Bledsoe and, you know, was having a good run. And uh, I remember I met Tom Brady at the old stadium. You remember what that stadium was like. It was like a high school field. Yeah. And uh, he was wearing a gray sweatsuit and he had a backpack and the backpack was full of beer because he had lost a bet on the Michigan, Michigan state game. And, you know, we graduated from college the same year and we sat down and we talked and um, he said something that at the time I didn't realize the significance of. And he said, you know, football has always come very easy to me. And at the time I was, I was really green and young in my career. And I was just kind of like, who says that? And then you look back on that now and you're like, he clearly, saw things in himself that nobody else saw. And it's moments like that that you look back on it that kind of can become a type of lore in retrospect. Why did the Ted Wells investigation focus on the fact that he asked Tom Brady for the emails and text messages and Tom Brady and his representatives refused? Mm -hmm. Why was that said yeah. during your investigation report when that clearly was not the case now that we know it to okay. be? Okay, and why in Roger Goodell's yeah. statement upon upholding the four-game suspension after the appeals process, was it all but put in red letters about Tom Brady destroyed his cell phone? Irrelevant to the process September 2007 the Patriots the league announces that they're investigating the league for illegal videotaping practices and Roger Goodell is trying to educate himself on seven years of illegal videotaping practices in a matter of days and he calls around the league and all the head coaches and all the GMs he talks to are just burying Bill Belichick. It's the height of piousness. you got to bury this guy. He's a cheater. He's dirty. You've got to punish him. Throw the book at him. And Goodell calls Mike Shanahan, who at the time, you know, was probably the second best coach in the NFL. And he was kind of a, a kindred spirit to Belichick. They had known each other since the 80s. And when Goodell calls Shanahan and he's like, you know, what do you think about this videotaping? What do you think it means? Shanahan reacts by telling Roger Goodell that he's jealous that he didn't think of the videotaping practices himself and that he would have broken the rules and done it in a New York minute because nobody had ever been got, nobody had ever gotten in trouble for illegally videotaping signals. And so you didn't know what the punishment was. So why not push every boundary? And he said, Roger, you can't say that Bill's a bad guy. He just is smarter and does this better than everybody else. And I thought that that was revealing, not only because it showed the mindset of the best of the very best in the NFL and how ruthless that can be, but it also showed the importance on a fundamental level of what they were trying to accomplish with that videotaping. You know, on a personal level, I'll never forget, I had a great relationship with Belichick until the videotaping happened. And I wrote some pretty stark things about it. And I have not talked to him since. And I'm going to ask you to read a little passage in the book in a moment. Uh, but Bill, I think one of the reasons why he has the kind of relationship that he has with people, both in the business, in the media, in life, is he sort of demands full loyalty. And uh, if you don't, if he doesn't get that, if he can, you know, he's going to cut that person off. Every great coach, Lars, has a weakness. And with Belichick, I think it's often with skill people. He's a defensive coach. He's missed on a lot of wide receivers in the league, in college. Uh, he struggled with tight end drafts, uh, running back drafts, very hit and miss. Um, and I could make the argument that he missed on Brady, that he thought it was about Tom aging, and it was really a lack of self-reflection that he had created such a poor group of skill people. Um, as I read the book, I, I, I wonder deep down when you did this book and talked to Tom, and Tom has the proverbial chip on the shoulder, but I wonder when Tom at some point in New England realized we just can't draft receivers. Even now, with the 200, 300 million in free agency, it still remains the weakest receiving core in the league. So even when 
acquiring Mohamed Sanu for a second or third round pick, Nelson Aguilar, Kendrick Bort, he's still not good at it. They still have nobody that separates. Do, do you think, you know, in your book, Tom makes the decision about a year out, but I wonder if he was having questions before that. I do. Uh, and, and look, Tom didn't dig deep on this with me, and, uh, and, and it wasn't like I spent a ton amount of time with Tom for this book, but pretty much everybody around him. Uh, I think, Colin, it can be distilled into something very simple. He did not feel appreciated by his boss. If, if it's me, right, you know, I want to be appreciated by my editors. Even Colin Coward, as successful as you are, you want to be appreciated right. for your job. And Tom did not feel appreciated. Uh, he would, he, uh, Belichick, who acts as the de facto GM, yeah. wouldn't give him the contract extension. And, um, you know, I, Belichick, in Tom's mind, was, was ready to move on. And, uh, in, in, you know, Tom's last throw, ironically enough, uh, I said Jameis Winston's last throw was a pick six. Tom's last throw as a Patriot was a pick six. And uh, as, as I mentioned uh, to you when we did the show, that Clyde Christensen and, uh, and Jason Light and Bruce, they went back and analyzed every single throw that Tom made uh, uh, the previous two seasons. And they realized he, he still got it. He still got it. And eventually they put a radar gun on him, still got the same velocity that he had uh, in the prime of what we thought would be the prime of his athletic career. And they was, uh, the, the conclusion that they came to is just, just what you said, didn't have the weapons around him. So why does Tampa become so appealing? Well, for starters, they got Chris Godwin, they got Mike Evans, they got O.J. Howard, they have a, a young, uh, really good offensive line. There was no promises that they were going to draft uh, Tristan Wirfs out of Iowa, but he becomes maybe the best uh, tackle in the in the best young tackle in the league. They certainly hit the ballpark out of that with with him, and uh, and then also a, a young aggressive defense and uh, a talented defense. And it, it took Tom to come in, and and this is what the the mandate from Bruce was: you can you need to make them know that they're good. And what did they, I mean, but Tom just walking into the building changed everything. Bottom line is very, very simple. Let Tom Brady play football. You want to go after the Patriots, go after the Patriots. You can't do that now because you can't retroactively re renege mm -hmm. on, 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 no. on the accept, on the accepting the fine, Bob Brad, yeah, Robert right. Kraft's billion dollar fine and yeah. confiscation of the first and the fourth yeah. round pick. But it appears as if as of right now, as of right now, and I'm not completely sold on it, but it appears that the NFL were after Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots, and essentially they just accepted going after Tom Brady. That is correct. That's how Thank it looks Thank you very right much now. for saying That's that. how it looks. But there's something in the first section that no one has written about, no one has talked about, that personally I find the most interesting thing in the book, and that is... Mike Riley, the former assistant coach at USC, uh, who recruited Tom Brady as a high school player. And then Mike Riley, the coach of the San Diego Chargers in 2000, who again was chasing Tom Brady. He didn't get him in as a, as a high school player, but now finally, as the head coach of the San Diego Chargers, he thought he was going to get him. So I want you to tell me the story of Mike Riley, Tom Brady, and the draft pick that never was. Well, Mike Riley has to be the most unlucky human being. <laughs> he, he spotted Tom Brady's greatness before anybody else did. And he, he's talked about it before. Um, obviously, I talked to him for the book. But he, he spotted Tom Brady when he was in high school. He was an assistant coach at USC. And he was told by John Robinson that he had, he had to recruit the Bay Area. So he went to Sarah High in San Mateo, where the coach told him the quarterback was worth checking out. And even though people close to Brady saw how special he was, um, you know, at one point, his high school coach told him, like, you're one of a kind. You're going to be playing in 10 years. Even though that was going on, Brady wasn't highly recruited on the at the beginning 
And Mike Riley really gravitated towards him and he loved him. And he, he, he had him down to LA a couple of times on recruiting visits. Then finally, John Robinson says, we can't offer him a scholarship. And so Brady ends up, uh, you, you know, ending up, he ends up going to Michigan years later, they bump into each other at the NFL combine. Mike Riley is the head coach of the San Diego chargers. Brady is a prospect dying to be believed, you know, someone who wanted to be believed in. And Mike Riley says, I, I missed you on you once. I won't miss on you again. He sent one of his assistant coaches to go to Michigan to research Brady, do all the, the material you can. Bobby Bethard, the head coach of the, or the GM of the Chargers says, we're going to pick a quarterback late. You know, who do you want? And on draft well, day. Well, wait a second. You skipped a step. Mm -hmm. The coach he sent to investigate all things Brady at Michigan came back, Mike Johnson, and he came back and he liked Tom Brady more than Mike Riley did. Yeah. Mike Riley liked Tom Brady so much that he sent Mike Johnson there almost to challenge his own bias, right? He was Back like, I, I like so much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So just make sure that I'm right here. Finally, draft day comes around. They're in the sixth round. And Bobby Beathard says, who do you want? He says, I want Tom Brady. Beathard says, okay. Mike Riley thinks, finally, I've got him. <laughs> and then Beathard comes back 20 minutes later, and he's like, you know, I like some of these other guys better. We're going to skip him. And, you know, the unwritten rule of being a head coach is the GM gives you your quarterbacks, you know. Especially when you are an offensive coach, a quarterback coach, with, which Mike Riley was. And then – Fast forward to today, actually 20 years ago today, October 14th, 2001, Brady is playing against the San Diego Chargers in Foxborough, and the, the Patriots are down, and Brady rallies them to tie the game, throws, it, throws his first touchdown pass in the NFL, and then wins it in overtime. And it's like the Shakespearean tragedy of this is just unbelievable that Mike Riley, when Tom Brady ran onto the field and they were down, late in the game, Mike Riley knew what he was capable of more than Bill Belichick in a lot of ways. And yet of all the guys who have overlooked Tom Brady and, and, and we've all, we've talked about them over the years, Mike Riley was really the one guy who saw his potential and was just never able to have the authority to actually capitalize on it and to coach him. It's just, it's an epic tragedy. And it's also just, you know, as a story and as a journalist, it's, it's an unbelievable story to tell. If you wrote the story of this season, it's ludicrous. Uh, Brady misses out on 1,500 snaps. We're in a pandemic. Uh, he walks into a house of a stranger looking for Byron Leftwich. <laughs> um, he's doing he's doing high school practice. Uh, he creates practices at a high school football field that a local affiliate gets uh, on video from a helicopter. Uh, I'm not sure he got in trouble with that or not. The whole thing was sort of make it up as they go. And I wondered when, with your relationship with Bruce Arians, when it was all said and done, was even Bruce a little surprised? I mean, it, it looked so chaotic on that Thursday night in Chicago. Uh, it was like almost duct taping things together week to week. With your relationship with Bruce, when it was all over – a little surprised, a scale of one to ten, a three. I mean, it, it is almost a ludicrous, hard to believe script in what happened. Yeah, uh, especially one with how the season started, uh, going into New Orleans and getting thumped, and Tom throws a pick six and throws another interception, and and then Bruce uh, publicly criticizes Tom. And uh, everybody was already like, oh, uh, in the national media, the, the marriage is over. It's dead. And, uh, and then when they're seven and five going into the bye, there were uh, some pundits who uh, were calling for Bruce's job saying, hey, uh, this isn't working. Uh, the, the Bruce Arians offense and the Tom Brady offense, absolutely not working. But, um, you know, they kept grinding away. And eventually, uh, as I said on your show the other day, and thank you for having me on and, uh, your show, and, and thank you for having me on your podcast, Colin. Uh, you've been a huge advocate for this book. I really yeah. appreciate it. I really you appreciate bet. it. Um, uh, you know, they had a, a melding of, uh, of uh, Tom's offense and, and BA's offense. 
Um, now, could Bruce have envisioned that they were going to be this good this fast? No. Uh, when they were seven and five, you know what Bruce was thinking? We're going to start preparing for next year. We're going to use these last games of the season to get ready for next year. He did not think he was going to click as quick as it did. And, you know, he didn't say that publicly, but that's what he was thinking privately. That's what he was saying to Jason Light, the, the general manager. He's like, hey, we're, we're one year away. But, you know, when he was recruiting Tom and then Tom uh, signs, one of the first things that Bruce said to Tom was, we are really good but our players don't know it because of this culture of losing. And, uh, in, in, you know, Jameis Winston the previous year, 30 touchdowns, 30 interceptions, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I, the, the last throw of Jameis's career uh, for Tampa was, was a pick six in the shortest overtime game in the history of the NFL. And afterward, you could just see the exasperation on Bruce's face when he when he just said, you know, Jameis does so many great things, but he also does so many terrible things. And so Bruce knew in his own mind, he didn't share this with his assistants, that he had to move on from Jameis. And really who they were targeting was Teddy Bridgewater. They thought uh, Bridgewater is going to be our guy. He's, he's from Florida. He'll, he'll want to come back home. And, uh, and then slowly uh, they get word that, that Brady could be interested. And if you remember at the NFL Combine, so this is pre-pandemic, right before the pandemic hits, yeah. uh, all the coaches get their, their time up at the microphone, right, and uh, in front of the national media. And Bruce is asked, hey, who do you, who do you, want, who do you want to be your quarterback? And he just said, Tom Brady, you know, and he had no <laughs> idea. But you know what he was doing? He was sending a message that went all the way up to uh, New England and, and through the, uh, the big iron gates of, of Tom's mansion, letting Tom know and Tom's agent, we want Tom. That's it for this video. I post a new Tom Brady video every day. So please like and subscribe. That way you'll always have a new Tom Brady video to watch every single day. Thanks for watching.